Great, yes. Okay. So yeah, I want to talk today, let me see, about, uh, about just, I'm going to tell you about the development of the sound uh, event detection work that we've uh, been doing at Google. So let me just share my screen here. Okay. And, uh, okay, so these are my slides. So yeah, uh, like John said, I was, I, was, uh, I was in academia for a while. And then um, actually I had a, a sabbatical. I had a stu former student who was working at Google in New York. Um, I thought I'd just come and spend a, you know, a few months uh, hiding out there. And then I turned out to be a much better fit for me. So I've, I've been here ever since. And I've, this is the work I've been doing since I, since I joined Google uh, five, six years ago. Um, and obviously I've worked with a lot of different people as a, because we have a team and a bunch of other past collaborators. So the basic idea here, when I joined, when I started at Google in 2015, it was, you know, it was relatively early in the time of um, object recognition in images using deep nets. And it was not a technology I was particularly familiar with. And it was also at that point, um, deep nets were beginning to revolutionize speech recognition. Um, which was something I'd worked a lot in speech recognition, but I hadn't used deep net classifiers. But I was at that point I was interested in other kinds of sound recognition, environmental sound recognition. I was using things like you know support vector machines to do this. Um, but it seemed like the results that we were seeing from deep nets on images were so impressive that it was something that we needed to try. Uh, for, like I wanted to try for audio events, and so that was the that was the motivation for let's do this, but do it for rather than arbitrary images, do it for arbitrary soundtracks and the goal was to be able to name the the objects the events that a person would perceive in a soundtrack um, in a satisfying way um, I mean I, I for me that was just like a, such an interesting challenge that it was it stood by itself but there are obviously a bunch of applications that are driving this uh, if you happen to have a large archive of multimedia content uh, you know you want to be able to find objects within that, efficiently, then you want the machine to be able to analyze them. That works for images, but it also makes work make, makes sense for soundtracks. And so, uh, you know, being able to classify the soundtracks of videos, or maybe you've got a database which is only sounds, is, uh, is one big application. The other applications are in real-time recognition. So now we have all these uh, smart speakers in people's uh, environments. There, that's a very it's an interesting opportunity. They're already they already have already always on listening for, to, to pick up the hot words, but there's an increasing opportunity for live local recognition of sounds for various applications like you know security and just uh, home automation. So maybe you can have a, speak, a smart speaker that automatically tells when you come in because it can hear the front door or something like that. Um, and then we've actually, I'll show you a little bit later, but there is a, an application we, that Google has released, which is um, to automatically transcribe sound events for deaf and hard of hearing people as an as a accessibility app so that you know you can have something that if it hears the phone ring or the knock at the door, it'll automatically uh, alert you on the screen. So how do we go about this? Basically, uh, as you most likely know, the secret to making deep learning systems work is having a lot of training data. And uh, within Google, we had the opportunity to uh, access, you know, the, the large archive of multimedia data that's represented by YouTube. It's not quite that simple because obviously we have to be respectful of the terms of service that the uh, users who upload stuff to YouTube uh, have agreed to. But within that, we're able to uh, find enough data to work with. And then we have, we had basically this example of doing deep learning from the computer vision community. Um, the idea was that we would take the starting point and then figure out how to best adapt it to audio, but it turned out that uh, there wasn't very much adaptation needed. It's surprisingly uh, generic, the approaches that have been developed within computer vision. And then the idea then is to generate some uh, event classification. So as I said, the real secret to these systems is the training data. And um, it, it, you know, it's one thing to have a lot of audio, um, and that's relatively easy to come by because as, you, know, you just have to record it. But you also, for these kinds of deep learning systems, the, the easiest thing to work with is labeled data. It's so-called supervised training, 
where you have examples of the audio and the appropriate label that you want the system to generate in response to that. Um, there, obviously with, with YouTube, there is a lot of associated metadata, like the titles of the videos. And within Google, there's, uh, there's, a, there's a lot of work we could draw on where people have tried to automatically categorize these into canonical sets of, of, uh, of labels. So that was one place to start. And then given a video and some labels associated with it, the actual approach we took was just a very simple local window approach where we said, we're gonna chop up the video into one second chunks. We're gonna generate a, a sort of a visual representation of that one second chunk using the spectrogram, which is a standard way of visualizing sound used in, in speech and audio for a long time. And then we're just going to basically feed that into a, a computer vision classifier and see, see, what, see how, that, how that works. And so here's like a one on the left is a one second chunk of a video that is labeled as being cartoon. And you know you see some stuff going on there. On the right is a video that's labeled as being dance and Myanmar and hip hop music. And you see that they're different. They're different. Uh, spectrograms, spectrograms themselves are not particularly legible, but there's clearly some information there that classifier might be able to get onto. The interesting thing here to note is that with the labels only exist at the level of the whole video, which might be like three or four minutes long. But we're assuming the labels apply to each one second chunk, and we call that weak labeling because it's. The label, labels are actually weaker than the individual samples we're playing into. Um, so where do we get these uh, video level tags from? And basically, there are a bunch of things you can you can sort of try to squeeze out of the out of YouTube videos. There's the title, there's the uploader, and there's a bunch of things you can associate with the uploader. There's uh, whatever other text is associated, like a description or comments, which you know typically not very informative, but there's some information. And there's also, um, if, there's, if there's speech in the video, then that is automatically transcribed using speech recognition. We can use that for um, as additional information. All this information is relatively weak, but um, there are some fairly sophisticated techniques used with YouTube to try and integrate all that to generate some fairly reliable high-level labels. Um, and so, and, but that, of course, they're not related to the sound. They're just related to this, the, the idea is that they're related to the topic of the video. And, but we can still use those. Some of them are going to be relevant to sound, some of them are not. There are a lot of different tags. We, uh, we started off with just a, uh, starting with a list of like 30,000 30, most popular ones, but most, many of them were not particularly relevant. Turns out that didn't matter that much. Oops. So, um, our, you know, it's easy to generate many millions, to find many millions of videos from, from a YouTube data set. Um, and so we you know we had like, we worked with hundred million videos and when we chop it up into one second frames, it's like 20 billion uh, individual patterns that we were training on. Like I said, we're using a set of 30,000 labels. So we train a classifier to generate say thousand labels. We don't particularly care about any of those labels individually, but the idea is if we can make the classifier generate those labels then the classifier will be uh, motivated to try and find the important information in, in the spectrogram chunks. Um, the labels have a very wide range of of prior of how often they occur. So things like music occurs like in after 20% of the videos, but, we, but the rarest labels we used, things like cormorant and lecturer would only occur in one in a million videos. So that was that set of labels, which were just like whatever we had available. We really wanted to have this process where it's gonna, the output of the system is gonna be videos that, um, sorry, labels that describe the sounds that people hear. Um, and so this is, there's been, there were, you know, we were looking at this work in computer vision, which has been very much driven by this so-called ImageNet data set. And for ImageNet, the original ImageNet, they took a thousand uh, objects, names of objects, things like, you know, airplanes and pizza and various dogs that so went down to dog breeds. And they, gen they selected a thousand images that were relevant to each of these labels. And that was the training set, that was their evaluation set. So we were looking at something like that, where we would come up with order of a thousand uh, sound event names, but there was no existing uh, list of those things. So we had to generate that from, from scratch. And so this is, uh, this is the so-called audio set ontology, which is really basically a hierarchy of sound, of sound events, but it was generated more or less by hand. We had, and it's like it's 600 or so uh, different event classes. Um, one place we started was these so-called Hearst patterns, and this is looking at web text and then doing a very simple kind of um, a pattern match where you have a phrase 
which is things like sounds such as X and Y. And then the, the assumption is that X and Y are then instances of words which describe sounds. And so you can find you know, thousands and thousands of noun, noun phrases which are used in those kinds of, there, there are like seven or eight of these different patterns. You can find a set of noun phrases which occur in the web in those kinds of patterns. And then you've got some candidates for what the terms of sounds are. But then basically I, had, I went through the most popular ones of those and then tried to organize them so that I could remove uh, synonyms and come up with a unique set and then try and structure them into a hierarchy so they were in different sensible categories. And so I ended up with seven top level categories, uh, human sounds, animal, music, natural sounds, sounds of things, source ambiguous sounds and channel and environment. And this was an extremely uh, ad hoc process, but we needed it to get going. And it's, it was hard enough that, it, that the people had written like little subparts or you know, sketches of parts of the ontology, but no one had ever tried to do a complete ontology of sound events before. And in fact, you know, a bunch of people started using this in, 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 the, in, in the time since we proposed it, not because it's perfect, but because it's, you've got to have something and it's, uh, it's a lot easier to start from something that exists rather than having to start from scratch. We have actually continued to improve this particularly in response to you know, places where we've tried to do something and found the ontology wasn't adequate. But um, it's, it's been remarkably uh, stable. So here's an example of um, the kinds of things that we have. So we use these so-called machine IDs, which are these slash M slash whatever. Uh, they're originally part of this thing called Freebase, which was an open uh, database of triples, but we've had to, they didn't, didn't really express sounds. They've had to, uh, reinterpret a bunch of those and have had to invent some new ones. But um, you know, they have for, for these 600 or so entries, we have an ID, we have a short name, we have a longer name, which is like one or two sentence description. We have a few examples typically of like YouTube videos where we actually see them as positive examples. And then we have a few other uh, attributes that we put in there. Um, so we have the set of videos from YouTube, we have a set of categories of sound events, but right now, you know, there's no immediate way of associating the two. So we need to generate some labeled data. And so we did an exercise where we um, collected labeled data uh, from scratch. We had a, a, a team of annotators who would uh, tell us, you know, would watch a piece of video and tell us whether a particular sound was present in that video or not. And that was how we got the data. The way we did this was rather than just having, having them watch videos and random, you know, try and pick from this list of 600 classes. Instead, we propose, we, we, we tried to find a video that we thought might contain a particular sound example based on metadata search, at least initially. We then took out a 10 second chunk of that at random, for instance, or somehow. And then we played the annotator, the 10 second chunk, and we presented them with a list of the sound events that we thought might be present, and then they would mark whether it was present or absent or whether it was unsure. And typically there would be between two and 10 of these sound events that they would have to select. The idea there was that it's much quicker for them to say whether a particular sound event is present or absent, rather than them having to navigate through and, and indicate the, the present sound events. And so that was successful, and we were able in a few months to get a couple of million videos uh, labeled this way. Um, but there were some, some interesting biases that came out of this process, which I'll, I'll mention a little bit later. Um, again, we, I said before that we had these weak labels that were labels that were only applying to the whole video. Now we have labels which are actually applying to a 10 second chunk of the video. So they're that much less weak, but st we still consider them weak because the actual sound event might be, you know, a fraction of a second but we only know that it's occurred somewhere within this 10 second clip. So uh, the original labeling was done in 2016, 2017. Uh, then as after we got original, our original classifiers working, we then went back and tried to get some more detailed label, labels going in particular having uh, time ranges indicated. So this is the kind of labeling interface we've used more recently where uh, the annotator sees the spectrogram, the spectrogram for the whole video. So this, uh, RNG thing is a visualization of the video. And when the video is playing, there's actually a cursor that moves across it. So the thing on the top is like a time axis and each of the major divisions is one second. And then they have these uh, ranges underneath where they can drag out a region 
and they can indicate a particular sound event that occurs in that region. And that when they're indicating the sound event, they are they can type in a new sound event, but it's restricted, it's filtered to be one of the 600. And then we have a set of annotators who have been doing this uh, enough that they've actually become familiar with the with the sound ontology, so they can they can reliably uh, use the most appropriate label for these things. However, this is much much slower, and so whereas we had millions of videos labeled with the just the weak labeling technique, we've only got um, tens of thousands or maybe a hundred thousand videos that have been labeled this way. However, we found that it's uh, it's it's actually helped us quite a lot in terms of uh, classifier accuracy. Um, I mentioned that uh, we, we were very inspired by the work in um, ImageNet, which was this open database of a thousand examples of a thousand classes of, as images. Um, and it drove a lot of the research, the, the academic research in that area for many years. It's, it's at this point, computer vision has moved on so far that that original database is now too easy, but still it's, it was very, very helpful. So we were trying to figure out how if we could do something similar for sound. And so one of, our, one of our priorities was to release this data set and uh, happily we were able to get permission from Google to release this data as a, as a way to help stimulate you know, the, the overall research in this area, which of course we can then benefit from as well. Um, so we released AudioSet as a, a database. And what it is, is the, the ontology I described before. And then uh, of, you know, for, for 2 million of these 10 second excerpts of videos, the appropriate labels that came from the annotators to describe those, those videos. And um, we actually, we ended up releasing just 527 of the sound event classes. And the criteria was that we had to have at least 100 or 120, it was, examples for each of those classes. And yet, so there were some classes where we didn't even, we couldn't even find enough positive examples. But for 527 of them, we had enough examples that we were able to include them in, in the public release. So this is great. And you know, we were, a lot of people have actually used this and it has had the effect we wanted of sort of forming some kind of standard for the field. However, it, the, the fact that it's based on YouTube did cause some problems because uh, the YouTube terms of service are that you're not supposed to be able to download the individual videos and store them. You're allowed to watch the videos, but you're not supposed to store them. So one thing we weren't able to do was to uh, release an actual you know, set of waveforms. We could release the pointers to the YouTube videos, but not the waveforms themselves. And so that puts, you know, that, that is this kind of contradictory thing where it's like YouTube, you know, Google is saying, here are some, here's some label data. And at the same time, Google is saying, but you're not allowed to use it. So, you know, people have done various things with that. And I feel like we're, but I, I feel like it's, it's been less than ideal because we haven't been able to promote it quite the way we want to. There's now a similar effort being done through freesound.org, which is a, a Creative Commons licensed audio database. They've used the audio set ontology, but done their own labeling of their own data. So that's uh, a much less uh, encumbered data set to work with. Okay, so that's basically the situation with the data. And as I said, the data is really the most important part, both for training the uh, a classifier, but also for simply just doing research in the field, because you need some kind of uh, common task and common ground truth so that people can compare their work and decide you know, what's going on. And so how do you actually compare, how do you measure performance for this kind of classifier? And we've actually gone through a bunch of, we've used a, a range of different metrics. So um, the, first thing, the first things we looked at were within class evaluation, evaluation metrics. This is kind of like the easiest thing to do. And the idea is I'm gonna build one classifier which will tell me whether a certain sound event is present or not. And so let's say it's, you know, the sound event is buzzing. I have a bunch of my 10 second clips which were labeled as containing buzzing by my annotators. I have the other clips which were not labeled containing buzzing. I assume they don't contain buzzing, although they might because it may, maybe I never asked the annotator if they had buzzing or not. That's what I mean about one of the uh, weirdnesses that came out of our labeling scheme. But on the whole, even if they do contain buzzing, most of them won't because buzzing is pretty rare. Uh, I then train a classifier to say, you know, these ones are positive, these ones are negatives. I have some held out data, which also is labeled as buzzing or not. And then I basically run, look at the scores coming out of my classifier um, on the positive example or negative examples and, you know, see, how to con see what the contrast is. I can plot an RSE curve, which is the thing on the top right, 
which is you know for a given threshold on my score count and my classifier, how many uh, how many of the examples that are true do I correctly do I label as true? How many examples which are false do I correctly do I label as true? Incorrectly label as true, and so that's the false positive rate versus the true positive rate. And RSC curve, you know, you want it to be as close to the uh, top left corner as possible, and you, typically they're a little bit softer. Um, and then to the RSC curve shows you the entire entire performance uh, curve, but you can characterize it as a single number by using, for instance, the area under the RSC curve, it's the AUC. We actually typically use D prime, which is the uh, separation between the sort of positive and negative curves, or the equivalent separation between Gaussian curves that would give you that that give you that area under the curve. And it's just D prime is a it's used in, in psychometrics. It's a, a good measure of how well separated the distributions are compared to the sort of intrinsic noise. And so a D prime of zero is guessing, a D prime of three or four is you know, very, very high, high accuracy. And we typically get D primes in the range of one to two. Um, oops. Okay. Um, the, um, we also have a precision recall curve, which is the standard kind of uh, retrieval thing where you have all your data, you order it according to the score, and you see how the precision, uh, how many, what portion of your hits are correct as you go down the list, as you go deeper and deeper into the list. And then there's a, a summary metric of that, which is the average precision, which is the average of the precision at every true example. Um, that, the, yeah, they're both, they're both good metrics. They have slightly different properties. The, we also have a, a, a different set of metrics, which are to do with looking at all the labels you apply to a video. So rather than trying to look at the buzzing classifier and find the buzzing, video, buzzing videos, I can look at a video, look at all the classifiers, and then say, well, which labels of this thing are true? And for that to, for, to, to get good performance there, I want all the different classifiers to have sort of comparable outputs. And so then I can rank all the labels by their score, and then I can look of the of the highest ranking labels, which ones are actually appropriate for this video. And so that's, uh, you can have label ranking average precision, which is average precision, but now looking at all the video, all labels for a single video. And then we, we developed this thing called label weighted label ranking average precision, which allows us to actually measure this uh, per video label accuracy um, in a per, on, on a per class basis. Typically we have these 500 classes, the metrics we look at, we measure, calculate a metric for each class individually, and then we do a simple average over all the classes. Our data, even when we try and balance it, it's still like, you know, almost half the videos are voice. And so, you know, if we just, if we weighted it by individual samples, then performance on, on speech on speech detection would dominate. But by balancing all the classes, even the really rare classes like toothbrush and zing, they also have an equal weight. And then it's, you know, we, where we're trying to build a classifier that is able to generate a large number of different classes. So those are those are different metrics that we try and optimize. Okay, so now we've got a, we've got the data, we've got the metrics that we're trying to use. So what are, now we can actually build the classifiers. Like I said, the starting the basic idea was well, we'll see what they're doing in computer vision. We can generate an image that corresponds to a sound, a standard way of doing that, and we can just apply that. And then once we've got that working as a baseline. We'll figure out how to how to adapt these more specifically to the problem of sound recognition. So you know this is the, this is the typical way of doing this in computer vision is these so-called CNNs, these uh, convolutional neural networks. And typically, you take the image, then you have a, a particular kind of set of weights, you know, deep net weights that you apply, but you slide them over the image so that they're applied independent of where in the image they occur. And then maybe downsample to get a smaller image, and you have a larger set of weights and you keep going until eventually you get down to a very small image, a lot of different uh, so-called filters, a depth axis, and uh, you know, you've got some, you've got a bunch of highly uh, derived features. And then you maybe have a fully connected network at the end to get you out to your final layer of, of, cl of classification classes. And so this is, you know, this is a standard, uh, fairly old network called VGG, but there have been a bunch of uh, improvements in the the division world, and when we apply them to uh, to sound, they give similar improvements. So um, these classifiers can be pretty big. The biggest classifier we use is uh, several, you know, around sixty-two million weights 
And because it's convolutional, those weights get reused a lot. So it's actually about 2 billion multiplies per classification. But that's, you know, that's actually, that's not, not, a, not no longer considered a particularly expensive classifier. And, you know, it, it worked pretty well. Now I said we would, this was just a baseline and, you know, because there are a bunch of things like images are not like, spectrograms are not like images. Spectrogram, the frequency axis is highly salient, whereas an image, an object can occur anywhere in the image and sort of has similar meaning. However, when we try to do things which are more sound specific, we've never seen any improvement. It turns out that these, these convolutional networks, although they were, they, they make a lot of sense in terms of images because of the translation invariance in images, they're actually quite a lot more general than that. And even when something, even when you've got a domain where the translation invariance isn't really so strong, they still end up giving you very good, very good classifiers. Uh, okay. Um, one of the things we, that has helped is this idea of trying to take these weak labels and make them um, improve them. So the, we, I said the labeling, the data we had said, okay, I, I play the annotator a 10 second clip and then I ask them if, if a particular class was present and they say, yes, but then all I know is like, there's this label that applies to all these 10 seconds. But in fact, the 10 seconds may have a bunch of uh, gaps in it. So in this particular example, you see the silence, which are the light gray portions, then these, these first bits are actually just plain speech. If you look at spectrograms before, you can recognize them as speech. And at the very end, there's some music that comes in. But this label, this segment was labeled as having music present and speech present. If I take the first one second clip and you know, label it as, as uh, music present, then it's, it's totally incorrect. So instead, uh, we, we trained a classifier and then we took the classifier output and we assumed that like, well, we know that there's some speech present in this, in this clip. And so if I look at the actual output of the speech classifier, if I take the highest activation of that and then set some threshold below that, I can maybe find, I can maybe exclude regions where the speech is not, is not active. And I can do the same for music. I can look, look on the music output, find the highest area and then set some threshold below that and then restrict the music label to that. And so that's what we see here. Here we, in the second and third clips, we see um, there are, labels of speech and music which are shorter than the whole duration. And then it turns out that the classifier was having a lot of trouble with, with silent regions because silent regions, there's no information, but it had been trained to say that they were music and speech. Um, what, because they were very common labels. So we also built a, spe a specific silence detector which took the silent regions and explicitly labeled them as silence. And then that, that helped with us with that uh, ambiguity a fair amount. Um, and so here are a bunch of examples of classifiers trained with different versions of those labels. So it turns out that even with the weak labels, we actually got very good uh, discrimination. So this is the classifier for the plop sound. The video, you can see these little vertical stripes are where there's a sound effect of plop. And you can see that even trained on weak labels, we've got reasonably good localization. But then when, when we refined those labels, um, you know, as in, this, in the way I described it in the previous slide, the, uh, some of the other classes get removed because there are a few examples of uh, silence, for instance, being labeled as some other class. And then when we add the silence threshold, uh, we get an even better discrimination because now we've got the silent regions being clearly labeled as silence and no, no confusion. So I want to show you this video that hopefully will contrast some of that. So one of, this is uh, Sean Hershey, who's one of the people who worked on this project. He's also a, uh, a trumpet player, plays a lot of instruments. And so he made this video, it plays a bunch of instruments and then we can run the classifier over the video and see what happens. On the left of the video, and I'm sorry, this is a little small to read, there's a list of classes and you'll see uh, as the video goes on, you can see these bars moving depending on how active that is. The top class is music, then the second one is trumpet and the third one is speech. And what you'll see here is the speech thing, because there's such a lot of speech in the, all the data, even when there's no speech present, the speech thing is kind of active. So let's just see what that looks like. Okay, let's record some sounds. Hoping you can hear that. So you see when the trumpet is playing, there's very activation for trumpet. But then in the gaps in between when he's not saying anything, the speech classifier goes up and gets. So
By contrast, this is the same video, but now with a classifier that's been trained using the refined labels. And um, you know, it's still able to pick out these instruments very effectively, but the speech thing is now active when he's speaking as he is now. But then when he starts doing something else, speech. And so you see now the, fact that the, the trumpet is, is actually more active than the music classifier because also music has a very high prior and tends to be hyperactive in the uh, unrefined labels. So that's the kind of um, classification we can get. Let me just show you some of the other things that he does in here. Um, there's, there's the piano, you see the piano thing. And then he also plays the vacuum cleaner at some point. Here we go. Oh, he's playing the, I don't know, he has a vacuum cleaner which is also detected. You'll, you'll see that later. It, it knows a bunch of classes. And the vacuum cleaner is that one is correctly detected. Okay. Um, except kind of like, you know, subjective results. We also obviously collect evaluate these objective results. For the 30,000 class, we're able to evaluate, you know, these are like the non-sound related classes that we got from YouTube. Um, we were able to evaluate those. Remarkably, there wasn't much of a, this is like the overall performance of that, of, the, of each class as a function of how common that class is, the prior of that class. And so over at the right, we have the very common classes like speech and music and vehicle. And over at the left, we have rare classes like Sterisha Harmonica, uh, which I don't even know what it is. But the surprising thing is that even some of these very rare classes, we got very high accuracy in classification. And just because it turns out they may be rare, but they're very acoustically distinct. So that was interesting. Um, for the audio set classes, the, cla the 527 classes that we defined to be specifically relevant to audio, uh, we also see a big range in performance. Some of them are easy to classify and some of them turn out to be very hard. This plot is showing the D prime, the separation between the positive and negative classes, and it's contrasting two different classifiers. The X axis is a small classifier, a mobile net, and the uh, Y axis is a large classifier, this sort of two, two billion multiply classifier using ResNet. And we see that, yes, the, uh, the, 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 the bigger classifier has on average a slightly higher D prime, a slightly better performance, but there's a fairly widespread, it's, you know, it's, it's, it's not, it's not a huge difference. Even, even the small classifier does reasonably well, I guess. Um, we can also vary the amount of training data we use because typically that's something that, you know, more training data gives you better performance and by artificially training on less of the data, we can see how much gain we get for a different amount of performance. This is 80% of the data versus 5% of the data. So 16 to one ratio here. Again, the actual performance increase is not as much as you might expect. We're actually doing okay, even for some of these classes, even with only 5% of the training data we use. But um, you know, it's still there are it's a it's a surefire way of improving your classifier performance. Um, and so we you know we have we also look at a lot of examples and we've developed a lot of these visualization tools like this uh, bar chart thing as a way of trying to figure out what's going on and we have various ways of you know finding a class that has a particular performance, looking at the scatter of all our examples for that class and looking at the individual examples that perform well or perform poorly for that class, looking at the, the score variations as a function of time, which is um, against the sound, which gives us some insight into what's going on. Uh, here's, so here's another video where we actually, um, we were putting together a demo video of this uh, classifier. We worked with a team within Google that generates a lot of uh, uh, videos and instructional content. And they were really interested. And so they actually went out and recorded a very wide range of sounds just to see what the classifier would do with them. And the results are pretty good. So um, here it is uh, clicking, clicking a pen, which actually it records this thing else. So this is a little dog. You hear the dog panting, panting and the blue bar, which is dog is picked up. Whistling, whistling is, you know, very clear and is always pretty easy, although it does misclassified as theremin, which is one of the classes we have, which is kind of cute because the way he's whistling is a bit theremin-like. Um, let's see, oh yeah, then this is like a little bell. No, so it has bicycle bell, telephone, and then bell. So there are a range of different bells that um, it knows about and they're kind of hard to distinguish. Amazingly, we have singing bowl and it picks up singing bowl, but then confuses it with 
tuning fork and in decay of the bell. Uh, maraca is recognized as that, and as music. Uh, I'll show you a couple more. So this is a ukulele, which is recognized as a ukulele, but his guitar, which is, you know, a very similar sound, but is correctly recognized as not being guitar. I think guitar fell off the bottom here. But the, the, some, of, some of these things, you know, sometimes it doesn't do great, like it didn't do great at the picking up the pen clicking, but some of the things it does remarkably well, that it'll distinguish musical instruments surprisingly well, better than I expected. So that's the basic classifier. A few other things that we're doing since, since the development of the basic classifier, we're obviously interested in trying to make this run on as broad a range of devices as possible. This example is running the same thing on an edge device. This is the, uh, the Google Coral, which is a TPU device running on a sort of a Raspberry Pi form factor. So this has a little microphone on it. And then the other cables, just the power and the display. And so it'll run in real time uh, with, you know, it's basically the same classifier uh, can, can classify sounds in real time and that, that works fine. And the smaller, I showed you the small classifier can work quite close to the larger classifier and that's made it, it that makes it, makes it quite viable. We also have it running on, on phones. This is um, the uh, live transcribe, which is mostly an app for transcribing uh, speech for, for deaf and hard of hearing people, but it also has a sound classifier running sort of on the side. It's using about 10% of the CPU. So you see in this example, it's saying that there's crowd noise in the background of this, of this recording. We also uh, ran a Kaggle competition with some, some collab our collaborators at freesound.org because you know, we needed to use their data. And that's been quite helpful in terms of promoting research in the community. Um, I said that the big, the easiest way to train these deep nets is with labels to supervise classification, but there's a lot of work in different fields trying to, um, uh, you know, to get around that. And so these are the ideas of semi-supervised uh, learning where you have unlabeled data, but you assume that there are various ways of assuming that things that are gonna be nearby are gonna have the same label or things like that. Um, that's, we're working on that. That's shown us some promise. We've recently started working with, uh, you know, rather than just 2 million videos, working with like, again, 100 million videos and using that to pre-train a classifier. And that's giving us some advantages. Um, I'll skip this. Um, also, there's cross-modal processing so that you can use the labels from an image classifier applied to the image part of a video as supervision for the audio part. And that is extremely powerful, has shown a lot of really interesting promise. And again, we're using that to improve the overall performance for for um, the classifier, although the labels, the existing labels we've got are very good, and so they're not easily over overcome. Um, ultimately, we're not interested in just recognizing the sounds. We'd like to have a deeper understanding of the sounds and maybe have a way of even resynthesizing sounds. Right now, I have these labels telling me sounds are present in 10 seconds, and I have this refined classifier that says, well, actually, this is the part of the 10 second that corresponds to the sound. And so one thing we're looking at is like, well, can we take those individual examples of the sounds and then train a model that can maybe generate more examples. There's a lot of work in this area of so-called generative networks, which are used for various applications. But I'm interested in the problem of, um, you know, if I can act, if I can describe a sound event as a series of these sound these sound event labels, can I regenerate that that whole sound scene just from those labels rather than having having to have the whole video? And I think that's sort of more how humans experience sound. I think it's a it's a nice target something we'd be able to do if we could do that then we'd really have a machine that was doing a good job of replicating what a, what a person hears in sound so that's uh that's a that's pretty much we're doing a few other things as well but that's a good sampling of what we're, what we're working on so just to to recap um the whole idea was to use deep nets to do the kinds of things that have been done in computer vision of recognizing objects and images to apply to computer audition if you like recognizing sounds event, sound events in real world scenes. Um, there are a bunch of different ways, reasons we want to do this. One very obvious thing is literally to provide captions of sound events um, that are, you know, that can go along with, with speech examples, the kinds of things you see in, you know, so closed captions for movies. Although we've, tr we've tried to do that and that's remarkably hard because they're very selective in the events that they highlight because they're the ones that have importance to the plot. But we have something that looks like that. Um, and then, you know, the nice, a bunch of interesting applications if you can have the stuff work in real time. Uh, if you can have it work, work locally, then you can get around a lot of the very serious privacy issues that come from always on uh, microphones, but 
we can we can make it run locally so we can uh, deal with that. And then there are various applications that are, that unlocks. Um, the the gathering the data was really the most important part to this. I mean, I thought I was into this because I was interested in these classification problems. But in the end, you know, every time we just try and borrow ideas from computer vision, it's, it's worked well for us. Um, but then at the same time, the problems of collecting annotated data were much more subtle than I thought. It turns out that, you know, exactly how you ask the questions and then various things you can do to try and clean the data afterwards, those are all very important and have turned out to be a lot of the effort involved. Uh, and then we're, you know, we're still, we're still working on it's trying to make it better. We're always trying to make it better right now. You know, we're looking at these, these issues of pre-training and then different kinds of label data and how to, how to take a small amount of high quality label data from strong labeling and, you know, improve the classifiers which are trained on larger amounts of data. And then looking at these cross-modal things like, so can we build a classifier that looks at an entire video, both the audio and the, and the, uh, and the video and the images and come up with a more human-like understanding of what's going on. So that's it. Um, I hope that was interesting. And I hope if there's time for any questions, I'm happy to answer any questions. So maybe I can ask you a quick question first. So you talk about pre-training. So do you want to use some, some similar to birth model to apply to the uh, audio events or you want to take it on some like the latest, you know, advance in the NLP? Yeah, word? okay. So um, that isn't what I meant, but I'll talk about that as well. So well, when, when I say pre-training, you know, I, I, I spoke, I, I, I talked about two kinds of classification. One was, so this, these 30,000 YouTube tags, which are like, which are very, very broad range of things. A lot of them, but a lot of them are like basically topics like aeroplane or gold or something like this. Um, the classifier that generates those labels is typically not that useful because it's often not very accurate for many of them. But to the extent that there's some kind of correlation between the, um, the audio content and the label, it learns something. And so what, when we pre-train, we train something on like 100 million videos with maybe 100,000 labels. We then throw away the final classification layer, take the embedding, the internal representation, and then we use that as a starting point to then fine tune, so we retrain, but on our, on our label data with labels that we care about. And it turns out that, you know, if you've got a ResNet 50, which has got, you know, tens of millions of parameters, uh, even though you can train that fully just on the 2 million frames we've got, it's better if you pre-train it first, even though it's not, I, it's hard to say what exactly it's carrying across, but there is definitely a, a substantial advantage, like 0.1 D prime or 0.2 D prime, which is a very large advantage for our point. So that's that's the kind of pre-training we're working on at the moment. Now the the bird type ideas are where you sort of it's more like this uh, these inferred labels where the bird is trained by sort of taking out a particular word and then assuming that that's the uh, the right category. Um, we there are, there are a bunch of ideas like that have been, that have been used in audio. And basically it's, the, it's, it's just proximity where you say, um, if I have two, I, I skipped over a couple of slides on triple training, but it's that kind of idea. You have, um, you, train your, you train your classifier to say, these two things ought to be more similar than these two things. And if these two things come from nearby points in the audio, the chances are they have similar class, similar semantic content, as if they're from different videos or from further away, then they're less, less, less positive. And there's been a bunch of work, including some work by us, that shows that that is an, an advantageous thing to do. Currently, our, um, our label data is sufficiently strong that still, it's, we can't do better than that with unlabeled data. But obviously, you can combine the two and get, and get the best result. So, you. you know, all, the, all these ideas from, from general machine learning, we're very happy to import them, and they always, they always uh, benefit us. The only things that you know that we're able to do that are more that you know that go the other way where we're able to learn something special is some of the stuff where we found that these weak classifiers actually were able to learn strong classification much better than we expected. And I think there's some insight there about like what happens with weak labeling that maybe is particularly visible in this domain and which maybe uh, can have something to, to teach other domains. Thank you. Do you have any uh, other question from the audience? Uh, if not, let's give them a applause. Thank you very much. It's awesome. Thank yeah. Awesome. Thank it's you. All right. Good to talk to you all. Thanks for listening. Thank you.
थैंक यू